All right, everybody, let's get started. Introduce our co-hosts here, Bobby Kennedy Jr. and Elon. I'll start by introducing uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I think everyone already knows he's a nephew of President John F. Kennedy. He's the son of Senator and Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, who was assassinated after winning the California primary in the 1968 presidential election. Before entering presidential politics, uh, RFK Jr. was an environmental <coughs> lawyer and activist in many areas. He was most famous for cleaning up the Hudson River. He was also outspoken on indigenous rights, a peace, and civil liberties. He's also the founder of Children's Health Defense, a nonprofit that protects children from toxic chemical assault from pharmaceutical drugs and environmental pollution. So with that, Bobby and Elon, I think we're all excited to hear what you guys have to say. Elon, it's a real pleasure meeting you. And thank you so much for hosting us. You're most welcome. I think this is a great opportunity for the public to hear directly from you and really looking forward to what you have to say. Yeah, I, I also just want to thank you for your leadership on the on just breaking this the hold of the censorship. In fact, I say one thing that that Twitter was always kind of the last refuge for those of us who are trying to talk about issues that departed from the official orthodoxies that were being censored on the other platforms. And the first real effort at censorship happened in February of 2019 when Adam Schiff done a letter to all to the heads of all the social media sites of Google, Facebook, now Meta, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, and others, and demanding that they start censoring information about vaccines that didn't that was non-compliant with the official narratives. And the only place, the only group that resisted Schiff at that time was ahead of the intelligence committee. So that was kind of the first indicator that the intelligence apparatus had an interest in public health. And the only one of the social media sites to resist those those imprecations was was Twitter when Jack was running this and he for some reason he was able to say no to them when the rest of them weren't. So I'm very happy and your arrival at Twitter, Elon, has been, I think, a breath of fresh air for our country. You somehow understood, although you're from South Africa, you somehow understood the tradition of free expression and how important that is to American democracy. So I'm very grateful to you. You're most welcome. Yes, I, th I think it's absolutely essential to have a robust democracy. We must have free speech. In the absence of that, democracy simply cannot function. Yeah, it, it is free speech and the free flow of information is the water, it's the sunlight, it's the fertilizer, it's the soil of democracy. Without it, democracy withers and dies. There's never been a time in history when we look back and say that the people who are censoring free speech were the good guys. They're always the bad guys. They're always, it's always the first step toward totalitarianism, but also you know, they, it's one of the things that the constitutional framers understood that totalitarian systems have a huge advantage over a democracy because they're more efficient. Democracy is sloppy. It's slow. It is. It advances two steps and then retreats one step. It is the product of a lot of debate and which is which is slow moving and laborious. And the only advantage, the big advantage that we have over totalitarian systems is that the ideas that, that mature into policies are first annealed in a furnace of debate. And the best ideas then triumph in this marketplace of ideas, which does not happen in a totalitarian system. And that's one of the things that the, the dynamics that the framers of our constitution understood that we would be able to outcompete totalitarian systems and outlast them because of this this dynamic that produced policies through debate and through discussion and conversation rather than through dictation. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. The, the thing about democracies and free speech is that it's like washing your laundry in public. Yes, you see things that have to, you know, there's dirty laundry, but at least you see it, it's not hidden. And it's essential to have that debate, even if you disagree strongly with one side of the debate. The, if you don't allow such debates, the thing is, I think people who are in favor of censorship really need to understand is that unless people that you don't like can say things that you don't like, it's not free speech. 
And if you if you start censoring, it's only a matter of time before that censorship is turned upon you. I, I mean, the First Amendment was written not for easy speech and likable speech and lovable people. It was written for hard times and to protect speech that nobody wants you to say. And I remember in 1977 when the Nazis wanted to march through Skokie, Illinois, which was a Jewish neighborhood, and the liberals of this country, the ACLU, turned out in force to support that right, even though they were appalled and disgusted by what the Nazis were saying and doing. They, everybody agreed that we had to be willing to die for their right to do so. And that was the, that's the whole base of democracy is that we allow people to talk. And one of the things, you know, that, and one of the things that prompted me to run for president is what you were talking about is the, the end of transparency in our country, that government, there's so much going on now that it's done secretively, that where the decision making is opaque, where there are people who are, who are making decisions who are not necessarily elect officials, that the public is fenced out and so many Americans today feel like the promise of democracy has been a bait and switch and that we're no longer living in a democratic system where we are actually the sovereign of our own destinies, that the sovereign, that the, the deciders of our own fate, that people over whom we have no control, that moneyed interests, that large corporations have taken over this kind of merger of state and corporate power. It's happened in Washington, D.C., in the state capitals. It's not only turned our regulatory agencies into predators against the American people. They're supposed to be our protectors, but also that all the decision-making, the real decision-making has been taken from the American public and that, you know, you see so many people. I'm in rural Pennsylvania today. And I'm surrounded by people who feel despair about our country, who are disillusioned, who are struggling with poverty for reasons that they don't understand, but they feel like they no longer are the masters of their own destiny. And I think a lot of that is because it's true. Our government has become an instrument of corporate power, and it is not telling. And because of that, it has to lie to us. You know, it, it can't afford to be transparent because if it actually told us what it was up to and why it was making certain decisions, people wouldn't put up with it. So everything has to be cloaked in fear and deception. And I think, you know, Americans, even though they don't understand it, they understand that something very wrong is happening to them. Absolutely. The, the thing actually I find truly bizarre and very different from the past is that it's not just large corporations and government that are in collusion, which has actually been the case for, for a while. I think it was Eisenhower that, that warned us about the military-industrial complex, for example, and, and he's someone who really knew about it. But the thing that I, I find difficult put to forgive is that the legacy or traditional media is also almost entirely, with some exceptions, working in lockstep with the, the government and with, with corporate America. And they it is the, really their obligation to question the government, not to go along with it and be their mouthpiece in, in the United States. This is insane. You know, I mean, the function of the media traditionally is supposed as the guardians of, of the First Amendment. They're supposed to speak truth to power. And instead, they've become propaganda vessels for the powerful, for, you know, the big for the military industrial complex, for the pharmaceutical companies, for and for other large corporations. You know, one of the mechanisms by which, which that media capture has taken place is by through advertising and particularly in the pharmaceutical realm. In 1997, we changed the law in this country. We had always forbidden the use of the media to sell pharmaceutical products. There was no direct to consumer advertising of pharmaceutical products. It was against the law. FDA changed that law in 97 and it launched a tsunami of pharmaceutical dollars into the advertising space and gave the pharmaceutical companies control not only of the platform for advertising their products, but also control of content on nightly news. I had this weird meeting with Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes, the founder of Fox News, and I had this very strange relationship with him because I spent three months in a tent with him in East Africa when I was 19 years old. And even if that was before he started Fox News, once he started Fox News, he became kind of this Darth Vader figure for me. But despite the fact that all the things he was doing to our country were antithetical to what I believed in, I 
kept this very fond personal friendship with him, and he would allow me on his network. And he would require his hosts, like Hannity and Neil Cavuto and Bill O'Reilly, to put me on to talk about environmental issues. I was the only environmentalist during those years who was regularly going on Fox News. And in 2016, I had done a documentary on the on mercury and vaccines, and I showed it to him. And he was very interested, and he had a family member who he thought had been injured by a vaccine. And he said, unfortunately, I can't help you with this. He said that any of his hosts who allowed me on TV to talk about this, that he would be forced to fire them. And he said that percent of his advertising revenues for the nightly news shows were at that point coming from pharma. He told me that on average, there's 22 advertisements on a nightly news show and eight, 17 to 18 of those are typically pharmaceutical ads. And he said, if any of his hosts allowed me onto their show without checking with him, he would be forced to fire them. And if he didn't, he would get a call from Rupert, but he said from Rupert within 10 minutes. And of course, he meant Rupert Murdoch, who is the owner of Fox News. And that kind of gave me insight to, you know, why nobody on TV wanted to talk about these things. Because as I said, the pharmaceutical industry not only is dictating, is using those shows, the platform to advertise its product, but there's only two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising. One is New Zealand, the other is the United States, and it's largely as a result of that, we take three times the pharmaceutical drugs of any other Western nation. We have the and we have the worst health outcomes. We pay more for health care than any other nation. And we're I think we're 79th in the world. We're behind I think Mongolia and Cuba and Costa Rica and our health outcomes. And and pharmaceutical drugs are now the third leading cause of death in our country after cancer and heart disease. And it's not just pharmaceutical companies. I was watching the other day, Good Morning America, and there was an advertisement, I think it was by General Dynamics on Good Morning America. There's nobody in the audience of Good Morning America who is buying killer drones. And so why is General Dynamics advertising on Good Morning America? Well, of course, they're doing those advertisements because they want to dictate the content. They want to be able to have an editorial control over the kind of Overton window that 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 Good Morning America is permitted, within which discussions on Good Morning America are permitted. So they want to make sure that we're that Americans are enthusiastic about our wars and and about you know our a belligerent national policy, so that they can continue selling weapons. And unfortunately, those are the those are the forces that are dictating a lot of what of the the, the official narrative that we hear from network TV and from the corporate owned television. Yeah. In, in fact, the, you know, Twitter has seen extreme pressure from advertisers as, and you know, as, at least in the West, seen a advertising boycott from a lot of companies. I would like to, for sure, thank both those companies that have stuck with us, like Apple and Disney and many others. But but we have in you know, it, for North America and Europe, seen roughly half of our advertising disappear overnight simply because we insist on free speech. So what you're talking about, I think the public does not realize the magnitude of the pressure, extreme financial pressure that is placed upon organizations to toe the line by advertisers. And I think this is fundamental corruption of democracy and the public should be absolutely outraged by this and, and something's got to be done about it. It's insane that they're literally trying to drive Twitter bankrupt. Oh, well, you know, I was really curious about, you know, about your decision to release the Twitter files because that, I mean, if I had been your attorney, you know, and I wouldn't be because I'm not a corporate attorney, but I can't imagine that any attorney for Twitter told you that, that was a good idea. And there was a time, you know, we were suing the, the social media companies for the censorship. And when we heard that you were taking over Twitter, our attorneys came to us and said, you know, Elon Musk seems very sympathetic to free speech. Maybe we should tell him that we're about to sue them all, but that we'll drop Twitter from the if he releases the, you know, the records of his communications with the White House. Because, and for people who don't understand this, in the audience, companies like Twitter are regarded as essentially publishing platforms. And if you're a publisher, you can print anything you want. 
and you can refuse to print anything you want. The government doesn't control that and nobody else does. If you're the New York Times, you have an absolute right not to print an editorial by Robert Kennedy. No, that's not censorship. Censorship is when the government tells you to do it. So Twitter, so we could not sue Instagram for deplatforming me. But if we could prove that the government pressured Mark Zuckerberg to have Instagram deplatform me, then then the First Amendment is implicated and it becomes illegal under American law. We had that proof for some of the companies, but it really, it was right on the borderline of whether judges would accept it or not. And it would have been very valuable to us at that time, the kind of information that was released in the Twitter files, but it, it would be I, at that time, told my attorneys, I don't think Elon would do that because his attorneys are going to tell him it would be insane because it would subject Twitter to to a litigation, to a liability risk. And I was so surprised and delighted when you did that on your own. And, you know, clearly you've been portrayed as somebody who is kind of this, this sinister agenda, but you're doing step after step that is not in your self-interest and that is clearly designed to protect freedom of speech and is designed for, you know, is coming out of some deeper place than financial self-interest for you. And I just want to tell you how much I admire you for that, Elon, and how grateful I am on behalf of my country that you would come here from another country and be the key instrument for rescuing American democracy and freedom of speech during a time of you know, when a lot of people were returning their backs on our constitution. Yeah, it's it definitely has been extremely difficult. If we if Twitter simply towed the line and did everything that, that the advertisers and especially the advertise the sort of various nonprofits that pressure the advertisers and you know, the whole sort of G D D E I movement, which is sort of having a, a much bigger effect on the actions of, of corporations than people realize. I mean if we simply go the line like everyone else, we would have, it's billions of dollars a year in difference. Basically, our, our, our revenue is cut in half because we didn't tow the line. So it just, it, it, the magnitude of this is extreme. And and it's frankly a struggle for Twitter to break even. Uh, we're hoping to break even, but we're, we're not there yet. And uh, But I, I don't care how much it costs or what it takes. If we lose free speech, we lose democracy. America falls. America falls. I don't know what happens to the world, but it's not a good thing. I mean, I'd love to hear any kind of details about, did you, did you talk to attorneys before you released the Twitter files? Did you talk to anybody else who told you you must be out of your mind to be doing this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everyone, I, I mean, every lawyer advised against it and said it was insane. That would get into huge trouble and I would be sued to hell and gone and it would be a massive disaster. I, yeah, I don't care. It's like, I don't care. I mean, I just... You know, it's easy for people to take for granted the system we have here in the United States, but it, it really doesn't exist anywhere else. You know, not even in say, you know, Canada. I'm half Canadian, and you don't have the free speech rights in Canada that you have in the United States. You know, perhaps a new government in Canada at some point will enact those rights because it's incredibly important. But, you know, I, I think if we don't protect free speech at all costs, we, we don't have a functioning democracy. And if we don't have a functioning democracy, nothing else matters. Let me ask you another question. What is it in your background that, you know, that you think gave you such firm convictions where you'd be willing to take this huge, massive, unspeakable economic hit on behalf of a principle for a country in which you weren't even born. Well, I, I should say I do very much consider myself an American, so... But what do you think it was in your background and your childhood or whatever? Were there any... Was there something that, you know, was it a civics lesson? Was it a professor? Was it... I, well, I love studying history, the history of civilizations, history of, of all kinds. And while, of course, the United States has made mistakes and, and is not perfect and it has at times done things that are wrong, I, I am of the firm belief that the United States has been the, the, the greatest force for benevolence in world history. And this is, again, not to excuse mistakes or, or bad things, and but that is, I, I think, the evidence for the United States being a benevolent force in the world is overwhelming. You look at things like, you know, the Marshall Plan after World War II. You know, at, at the end of World War II, the United States had overwhelming military might. It had the nuclear bomb. And the United States could have taken over the world. It could have acquired whatever countries it wanted. And yet it, it didn't do any of that. In fact, it gave 
money to to the to the countries that have been, that have been fighting. I, I'm not sure if that has ever happened in history. It, it helped rebuild the United States, helped rebuild Germany and Japan, helped rebuild Japan even after things like Pearl Harbor. I mean, is, this is I, I, one has to really I, I, maybe this has happened before. Actually, I'm not aware of it, and so. You know, so I, I, I'm very in favor of America. But, but again, it's not to say that we can't do better or, or, you know, we need to, we do want to do better. We want to maintain that. But anyway, so I'm a huge fan of it. And I, I don't, you know, I also want to point out, I, you know, I, I don't have you know, any homes outside of the United States. I do not carry any other passport and I will live and die here. Well, that's very moving and very admirable. And thank you for, you know, thank you for your service and commitment to our country, Elon. And I, you know, I, I've been watching you and watching the way that you've been mischaracterized by the press, mischaracterized by people in my party, the Democratic Party, as somebody who is a threat to democracy when everything that you have done has indicated a, a you know, you're just incredible commitment. You know, during the revolution, there were, we lost between 25,000 and 70,000 people during the revolution who died to give us our constitution. And those people also put their livelihoods on the line. They put their property on the line. They put their financial status and their social status on the line. And in a way that, you know, for principles and, you know, I've watched you do the same thing and you've been such an example to other Americans of how we ought to be behaving, even if it costs us a lot of money. And even if the risks don't seem worth, the personal risks don't seem worth it. You've done that and you've done it without, you know, having any kind of reputational benefit from it. You've been vilified for it. So I, you know, I want to thank you there. I do want to ask you a question about because I, you know, I really started admiring you when I saw an interview that you did years ago, where you said that you said that we should be terrified of AI, that you said, I think I, I quote you this, you said first it's going to take our jobs and then it's going to kill us. And so, you know, and that, that, felt, that felt like real honesty to me from somebody who is at the center of the tech industry and even, you know, working on AI stuff. And then I see what you're doing with, and it seems to me that is a technology that could potentially be really horrifically de uh, denigrating to democracy and human freedoms if it's taking the wrong direction. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, Neuralink, first of all, it's important to appreciate Neuralink, which for those who are unaware of it, is Neuralink is develop, developing brain-to-computer interfaces to allow direct communication with the brain. It, the Neuralink will progress very slowly because Anytime you have a device implanted a human, the FDA requirements, I think, correct, correctly, are extremely difficult. And you have to pass many hurdles to have that work. The, the first applications that we're talking about are simply enabling someone who is a quadriplegic or someone who has, has lost a connection from their brain to their body to be able to communicate. Say, if Stephen Hawking was able to communicate as well as someone with a fully functional body, that would be... Incredible. So the, for many years, the applications simply be to enable functionality that people have lost due to uh, spinal or brain injuries. Long term, I, I think it has a hopefully uh, some chance of mitigating the artificial intelligence existential risk by enabling a closer symbiosis of AI and humans. And I certainly agree that this is not without risk. And, uh, you know, it's something we need to be very careful with how it's done. But I just want, do want to emphasize, it's not going to happen suddenly. It'll happen very slowly. And at least looking at the advancement of artificial intelligence, I, I think we will probably have digital superintelligence before Neuralink is, is sufficiently advanced to have high bandwidth communication between your sort of cortex and the, and the, sort of the AI extension of yourself. But no, no question, we need to be extremely careful and we will be extremely careful and it will move slowly. So you'll definitely see it coming and people have an opportunity to object and raise concerns and issues. And with Neuralink, we're also trying to be extremely open book and you know, so there's nothing hidden. And we, we are, like I said, or, ordered extensively by the FDA. So now with respect to, to artificial intelligence or more realness, like there's, there's levels of artificial intelligence that, that are not dangerous. Like I, I don't think, your, your self-driving cars are, are really dangerous or, you know, having uh, better autocorrect is dangerous, but it's when you have some deep intelligence that is uh, far smarter than the smartest human, that's where 
links could uh, get dangerous. No, I, I I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because that, that's a big one. But but it but I it's not that I think that digital superintelligence or AI AGI is definitely a bad thing. I just think it is it's a very powerful technology, and that there is there's certainly risk of it being a, a bad thing and acting in uh, a manner contrary to the interests of humanity, and that we need to be cognizant of those of that risk, and we need to just be very careful and thorough and do our best to ensure that it is beneficial rather than harmful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if I do get in the White House, I think that's one of the things that I need to pay a lot of attention to is how do we regulate this? And how do we bring in the people who are developing it and, you know, immediately from all over the world and figure out a way to regulate it so, you know, so that it doesn't end up killing us all or enslaving us or whatever the heck it's going to do. But even, you know, even the even self-driving cars, I think something like 40% of the jobs in America are from our driving jobs or involved driving. And if you get rid of those jobs, like even Uber jobs, which are an entry level, which we could do in the next decade or not, I mean, it, it's going to be it's going to be a really difficult challenge for our country to figure out, you know, what what to do with all these and i'm using a very bad characterization but you know surplus humans because that's what a lot of people are going to feel like yeah so i do think there is an avenue for uber driver or, or drivers in general in that there'll, there'll still be a need to manage and, and take care of a, a bunch of self-driving cars almost like a shepherd tending their flock and so i think it, it actually couldn't end up being a good thing in that you know instead of driving one car you can actually manage uh a sort of a fleet of tan cars, and I, I think that's good. I'm, I'm not just saying that it will not result in disruption or changing of jobs. I'm just saying that self-driving is, it, it, I don't think, is an existential risk to, to civilization. And and, and I, I like so I think the I think I think it will be, I think, in my opinion, a significant net benefit. But I do believe that we should be critiqued. We should be asked these questions. And I mean, in, in general, I aspire to take the set of actions that maximize the probability that the future will be good for humanity. That is not to say that I do not make mistakes, I say I, I do, but that is at least the intention. And but, but as I said, I think it's good to have critique, it's good to be questioned, it's good to be pushed on these issues, and it's very important for companies to be as open book as possible. But, but actually, perhaps, uh, I, mean, I think these are really interesting topics for, for people, but I think uh, a lot of the public would, would love to hear about your, your presidential run. Well, I would love to talk about it. Do we have any questions? Well, we, we have a bunch of questions. We can pull in. We have a few people we can pull in, and then we can pull in more as well. So Tulsi Gabbard's here. Bology's here. Michael Schellenberger's here. Omid's here. Before we leave the censorship topic, you know, Bobby, one thing you mentioned that you went over really quickly was that you were just reinstated to your Instagram account and that you've been locked out for two years. And I guess they had to reinstate you because there's a law requiring it when someone runs for president. So apparently the only way to get free speech in this country is, but, but the crazy thing is that people on your campaign were frozen out of their accounts. Apparently anyone who signed up with the team Kennedy email domain yeah. uh, was frozen. I guess they just got reinstated. Yeah. So I guess I just want to hear about that. And then following up on what Elon said about the intense pressure that Twitter is under from advertising boycotts, I want to bring in Schellenberger who was one of the key authors on the Twitter files and has done a lot of work on what he calls the censorship industrial complex. So it'd be great to hear from him on how this whole thing gets organized, because I don't think people understand that these pressure tactics are highly organized. So I guess, Bobby, to you first, and then let's bring in Sean. Yeah, so I was uh, evicted from Instagram, I think, in the summer of maybe, or spring of twenty. 2021, I was evicted and I had about, I had, uh, I had at the time, the day I was convicted, I had about, or evicted, I, I had about 770,000, but I had been up to 900,000 and they would cut them back. Whenever I hit 900,000, they would cut them back to 800,000 or 700,000. So I was losing followers the whole time. And they said it was because I was, I was promoting mis misinformation, but the term misinformation had nothing to do with, as we now know, from the Twitter files and from the emails that Meadow, you know, at that time, Facebook, that we've recovered from Facebook. 
and it had nothing to do with factual accuracy or inaccuracy. It was simply a euphemism for any statement that departed from the government orthodoxies and government proclamations would be characterized misinformation. And there is nothing on my Twitter feed that was factually inaccurate. Everything that we put up there, that I put up there, was cited and sourced to peer-reviewed publications or government databases. There's nothing on there that was that anybody's ever been able to point to, including Facebook. When I appealed, I tried to appeal, and I, we did a lengthy memo showing that I had never put up a single factual error in that, in you know, in my post, but they then they wouldn't let allow me to appeal. They had a be an appeal system, but they would not allow me to enter that system. And I feel confident I would have won because the people that they actually selected as judges were a really good group of people. They were law professors from mainly law professors from universities around the world, and many of them were people I was acquainted with. And you know, I was a law professor at that time, and I'm confident I would have gotten a fair hearing from them. So they wouldn't let me even into the appeals process. And then, as you point out, in the last since I've declared for the presidency, now we have about 50 people working for the campaign, and each of those people has a had a you know, Instagram handle, which said, for example, my daughter-in-law, Amarilla, said Team K. And they wanted to use that handle on their Twitter, on their, their Instagram accounts. And Instagram would send them, when they attempted to register, Instagram would send them a flag saying, you've been suspended for 180 days. And so none of them were allowed on. And of course, that's illegal under the, you know, it's, it's called Section 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, which regulates speech. It protects speech during presidential and other federal election campaigns. And so, but I think that Meta, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be pointing the finger at Meta right now because I think it's time for healing in this country. And I'm happy that I've been reinstated and they gave me back all my old posts and they gave me back all my old followers, which I didn't even know if they existed anymore. So I'm very happy with that. And the people that we've been working with at Meta have been, you know, recently have been very cooperative and they're now letting our people register. And I think it is, you know, not everybody had the foresight of Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey of saying, okay, this was really wrong and we're not going to put up with it even if it causes billions of dollars. There, you know, a lot of Americans were living in fear and they were doing things that they believed were proper and right at the time. And I think it's time that we, you know, that we focus on healing and bridging the divide. So I don't want to I want to really thank Meta for reinstating me, and I hope this is going to be the beginning. I hope we learn something from that process and that we can go forward and make sure that nothing like this ever happens to the States of America again. Michael, do you want to jump in here? This might be a good time to talk about what you've learned. For what it's worth, you know, I don't think... Yeah, that sounds great. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I don't think that Meta as a company wants to be censoring people, I just think that they're under incredible pressure and didn't stand up to that pressure. But Michael, can you speak to that, what you found? I think we lost them, did we? Hello? Michael, we had you a second ago. Well, sure, I'd be happy to. And can you hear me okay, David? Yes. Yeah, we can. We can hear them. Good. Well, thanks so much for having me, guys. And uh, Mr. Kennedy, it's a real honor and a privilege to hear you speak. Uh, we, we don't agree on everything, but you're... Oh, sorry, guys. Can you hear me okay? We could. You, you we lost you for a second. Can you hear me now? Great. Well, first, thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy. I really appreciate your strong remarks. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, but not anymore. You, you muted yourself. All right, my Gorg. We will go back to you. There you are. David, can you hear me now? Yeah, we uh, can hear you. Great. Great. Well, well, first, thanks so much, Mr. Kennedy. It's a real privilege and pleasure to hear you speak so eloquently on the first amendment. Just to build on but the Twitter is under from government. And Twitter is a platform transparent about the, the censorship demand. I, I'm curious if you would support a call that many of us have made that there should be a mandatory requirement by both government officials and by social media platforms to be transparent about the censorship decisions that they're making. Because so much of the problem occurs when the censorship is happening behind closed doors and there's no chance to appeal on the other hand, it's very hard to, to regulate social media companies by the government since that would infringe on the First Amendment. So I'm curious if you've thought about the need for 
requiring transparency by everybody involved, whether it's governments or social media companies, or even advertisers who are demanding that certain content be censored at their behest. Yeah. And actually, Michael, I think that's a, you know, really good solution. And if I'm elected, I'm going to call the heads of all of the social media companies into the Oval Office and, and have a, a conference and not walk out until we have figured out how to make this work and make it consistent with democracy. And I, I think you're right. I think David Sachs was right when he said that these companies do not want to be censoring us. They're coming under tremendous pressure from their advertisers and from, you know, very powerful government entities to participate in the censorship. And we don't even have an idea about all of the different uh, forms of pressure that they're coming on to, that they're coming, because the government, of course, has big contracts with these companies that are existential. And, you know, we just don't, that's all not transparent. And I think the companies, if they function more as common carriers, and I'm not saying being declared common carriers, which is kind of the ultimate sanction, that if they continue to, you know, censor that would be something that you would consider. But I think if they functioned, as you say, almost like common carriers, where all the decision making was transparent and where people felt like they had a right to see the algorithms and to understand the algorithms that were being used to, to censor speech and to make recommendations, et cetera. I think that's a really elegant solution about how to solve these issues. You know, there, there is some speech. I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist. And I think the remedy for misinformation is more is information. It's information. And the re remedy for bad speech is more speech. It's never censorship. Censorship is by far the worst solution. There are forms of speech that are not protected. You know, inciting violence is not protected. Pedophilia and, and you know, solicitations like that are not protected speech. And you can censor those, but... If it's protected speech, I don't think it should be censored, but I think in any case, we should understand the logic, the algorithms, the methodologies, and we should all have access to those so that are, you know, that's key because these institutions are now the public square. And, you know, they are the place where speech takes place, that you can talk to other Americans. And, you know, we have to figure out a way to integrate them into our democratic value system. Well, that's really wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for that. It's a strong, it's a very strong endorsement of the transparency, which is, I think, something that brings together people on the left and the right. Uh, we're going to, we, we solve our problems with more speech, not less. And I think that's what the transparency, mandatory transparency by everybody who's demanding censorship, but that's what that would give us. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let me pull in Omid Malik, who I think has done uh, a bunch of work in the, on the corporate side on sort of boycotts and pressure. Uh, Omid, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. You know, Robert, you've spoken eloquently on regulatory capture, whether it's the CDC, the FDA, or the EPA, or even NIH. I mean, how is it that Tony Fauci has over $10 million available to him, even though he's been a bureaucrat for 50 years? These are questions that I hope an intrepid reporter would look into. <laughs> but I want to just flip it on its head, which is to say, what about corporate capture? The fact that elements within the federal government are actually adversely affecting our economy so that, uh, as we've touched on here around speech, but it's even worse than that. I mean, the CIA, the FBI affecting our ability to communicate with one another through these big tech companies that are being pressured by them. But even, uh, as you're very passionate about, using OSHA unconstitutionally to try to force employees around this country for a period to take a shot that many did not want to do and making them choose between that and putting food on the table. So the two part question is one, how do we prevent our bill of rights from being violated by private actors when the government uses them to do their dirty work? I'm not just talking about censorship here. I'm actually talking about the depriva deprivation of economic liberty. And then secondly, is how do we get wages up? And is that then I want to ask you about that specifically. Can you get wages up finally in this country by actually having a border and restricting immigration? Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, let, let me just address that second issue first, which is, yeah, we need to seal our border. That the function, you know, it, it is a key existential function for every nation in the world to be able to control immigration at its borders. And having millions of people or hundreds of thousands, in, in this case, millions of people flowing across the border is not something any nation can or should put up with. And you know, worst of all, it's created a humanitarian crisis at the border. The notion that we have an open border is now a gospel around the world so that people are flying in from all over the world, from Europe, from China, from Asia, taking full planes to Ecuador. And then there's a, you know, there's a, and, and being assisted by nonprofit groups and by government groups to actually make their way to the United States border and it was in buses. And, and that needs to be shut down. And one of the ways that we do, and a lot of the Latin American and Central American immigration is the direct result of bad U.S. policy policies in the South, austerity programs, the war on drugs, the funding of death squads, the installation and support of juntas, military dictatorships, and genocides in those countries that have been happening for decades. And we need to address those issues. But, you know, above all, we need to seal the border. I'm actually going to the border tonight. I will. I'm crossing the border, I think, around three o'clock in the morning into Mexico, and I'll be talking with people on both sides of the border and talking to the stakeholders. And over the next three days, be meeting with people from the Border Patrol and elsewhere to try to formulate policies that will seal the border permanently. You know, the uh, the flow of, we have people in this country who are poverty stricken and who don't have access to, because the, the, the paucity of public assistance don't even have access to public assistance. And, you know, we need to be protecting the people in this country and our urban populations, rural populations, 50% of Americans could not put their hand on a thousand dollars. If there's an emergency, we don't have the capacity to support a lot of new immigrants, this huge flood of new immigrants is coming into our cities and stressing the school systems, stressing the, the social service systems for people who are already, for Americans who are already struggling with. It needs to be turned off. And that's what I will do as president. I will, I am going to, and you know, there's other countries that have this issue. Israel has this issue with African populations and using a, a variety of different te technologies at their border uh, some fencing, but mainly technological surveillance, they've been able to shut it down. And we need to be doing the same thing. And as president, I will do that. I will also open up legal immigration so that the immigration that we do need that's going to be beneficial to our country and economy will continue. But we cannot have uncontrolled immigration at the border. In terms of the, the role of you know these agencies and in compelling behavior from U.S. corporation, it is appalling. And it and as soon as I get into office, I'm going to issue an executive order forbidding the the federal agencies, whether it's NIH, whether it's the CIA, the FBI, from participating in any efforts to censor speech by the American public or to compel other behavior from the American public that is not legally required. And that's what we saw during the pandemic. We saw it, you know, in the vaccine mandates and we saw it in the, the censorship of speech. And I will forbid that and make sure that it is, that it does not happen, at least during my term in office. I, I, immediately, the first week I'm in office, I will sign that executive order. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Yuan and David, for hosting this. I also will close by saying it is somewhat ironic that the Democratic Party is not permitting democracy to occur within their own party and at giving a platform to Robert to at least debate Joe Biden. Well, that, that's an interesting point. Let me pull Tulsi into the conversation here. Tulsi's former Democratic congresswoman, who I believe is now an, an independent. I want to get, I actually have a question for both of you guys about the evolution of the Democratic Party. Bobby, the Democratic Party of your father was the party of peace over war, the party of free speech over censorship, the party of civil liberties over the surveillance state. And today you're perhaps the only prominent Democrat who is taking that sort of dissenting side on those issues. Tulsi, I think you feel the same on, on those issues too. I, I guess my question is, what happened to the Democratic Party? And to be sure, ma many of these afflictions are bipartisan, but there used to be a very conspicuous wing in the Democratic Party to oppose these things, and it seems like there isn't anymore. 
So I guess my question for both of you is what happened and can it be fixed? I mean, I, I'll just answer briefly and then I'd love to hear Talib's answer. You know, I watched this happen in the Democratic Party. I watched some of this happen. I mean, they. I think the Democratic Party became the party of war. I, I attribute that directly to President Biden because I, you know, President Biden is always, although I've always liked him, the one part of him that I did not like is that he's always been a very, in favor, very bellicose, pugnacious and aggressive foreign policy. And he believes that, that, you know, violence is a legitimate political tool for achieving America's objectives abroad. And that in many cases, it is the it's the first and most prominent tool that the federal government used during the Iraq war. When my uncle was fighting against that war, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, more than any other senator, was the man who was promoting that war. And I think that's one of the reasons he got the support of the neocons. And, you know, all of these, the neocons, for people who don't know in neocons are the neocons that were called neoconservatives, but they were a group of people who had departed from both Republican and Democratic parties in the, after the defeat of the Soviet, or after that, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were a group of people who, who uh, prominent intellectuals, who took the position that America had won the Cold War and that as victors, we should enjoy the spoils. And they published a plan called a Project for a New American Century that essentially argued that America should use its military domination, its military superiority now as the only superpower to impose an American hegemony, an American control, to use violence to impose an American control of all the countries in the world. And, uh, and that group... I think 22 of those leaders ended up in the State Department and White House during the George W. Bush's administration. They orchestrated the war. They had a plan for seven wars that we would fight very quickly in order to defeat uh, all of our, our non-compliant countries in the Middle East, beginning with Iraq. And they, would, they launched the first preemptive war in American history, a war against a country that never did anything to our country. As I've pointed out, there was a trillion if that war cost us, that war in its aftermath in Libya and, and Syria and Yemen and, and, and Afghanistan and Pakistan. It cost us eight trillion and we got nothing. Iraq ended up worse in a worse place than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We killed almost a million Iraqis. We pushed Iran, Iraq into becoming a proxy to Iran, which was the foreign policy outcome that we have been trying to avoid for 40 years. We created ISIS. We drove 2 million refugees into Europe, which destabilized all the democracies in Europe probably for two generations and ended up with Brexit. That's what we got for the $8 trillion. As a result of that cataclysm, Politically in the United States, it became a neocon. They were in disgrace. They were exiled from all political parties. But somehow they got back into the Biden White House. And people like Victoria Newland, who, whose husband Robert Kagan was the, the author of the project for the newest American century, ended up running foreign policy. Avril Haynes and Anthony Blinken ended up running this very belligerent foreign policy that we're now dealing with. On the medical side, you know, I watched what happened. Initially, pharmaceutical companies were on the side of the Republican Party. And Democrats, they were, you know, they were regarded with kind of contempt by Democrats as, they, as the most corrupt industry in the country. They paid the four companies that that manufacture all American vaccines, Sanofi, Glaxo, and Pfizer, paid over the past decade $35 billion in criminal penalties more than any other industry. They've paid the biggest criminal penalties in American history. They are serial felons, these companies. They keep doing the same play over and over. And they were not well regarded in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has always had a problem, is it cannot accept corporate dollars in good conscience. So the Republicans always had a lot of money. The only people that Democrats could could maintain their purity and collect money from would be trial lawyers and and labor unions. But the labor unions declined precipitously. So they're now they went from about fifty percent to ten percent of the American workforce and so all they, we were left with was trial lawyers. And President Obama was trying to get Obamacare passed. He 
Shark got a golden handshake with the pharmaceutical companies. He could not get it. The pharma has more lobbyists on Capitol Hill than, than Congress and all the congressmen, senators, Supreme Court justices combined. They give more to lobbying twice with the next biggest industry, more than any other industry. And President Obama, they could have Obamacare forever. So Obama needed to placate them. And the way that he did it was by making this terrible deal where the federal government could not bargain over the price of pharmaceutical products and Medicare or in Obamacare. So Obamacare was going to be big, create this flood of money to the pharmaceutical industry to buy their products for free, for the patients for free. But we could not bargain like you can in Canada and every other nation. You couldn't bargain with them so they could charge anything they wanted. And that sealed the deal. And all of a sudden, pharma was on the side of Democrats. It became permissible morally for Democrats to accept money from pharma. And within a, a year, Democrats were getting more money from pharma than Republicans. And then, and so that put them on the side of the you know pro vaccine side. They were kind of we kind of divided evenly. And then, interesting, President Trump ran, and three times during his presidential campaign. He made the statement that he thought that vaccines were causing autism. And that created this, that issue then became part of the culture war. It became part of the cultural divide. Democrats put that issue into the same anti-science dumpster as President Trump's climate denial. And it became now a badge of your party, of, of your tribe. And if you ask questions about vaccines, you are a Trump Republican. And if you if you had a just a religious belief in their efficacy and safety that could not be questioned, you were a Democrat. And so I watched that all happen, all that play out, and watched the Democrats slowly become these pro corporate, pro war, pro censorship Republican. You know what had once been Republicans, and the Republicans then became anti censorship pro-civil liberties, anti-war, and, and there's been this tremendous realignment. And I would talk more than I wanted to because I really want to hear from Tulsi and, and hear her take on it. Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. And, and thanks for the question, David. So much of what you said is what drove me to leave the Democratic Party. You know, I wasn't born into a family of Democrats. My parents, frankly, were pretty independent-minded people. And so when I first ran for the state house, a seat in the state house of representatives in Hawaii, 20 years ago, I had to decide, you know, which party I wanted to join. And as I made that decision, I was inspired by leaders within the Democratic Party. Frankly, Bobby, people like your father and your uncle, people like Martin Luther King Jr., Democratic leaders in Hawaii who had gone to the mat for the plantation workers who were people from Hawaii, people from across Asia, people, immigrants from around the world. It was Democratic leaders who came in and fought for their rights to be able to be treated, frankly, like human beings and be set free from the oppressive landowners that were Republican in Hawaii at that time. And so the ideals of you know, freedom and civil liberties and a big tent inclusive democratic party that welcomed people from all backgrounds and, you know, different ideas was really attractive to me and was why I joined the democratic party. But fast forward to where we are today, as you said, Bobby, I mean, today's democratic party is a party that is, is under the complete control of this elitist cabal of warmongers. Not only is it being led by warmongers, but we have a situation now where, as we saw last fall, where the Congressional Progressive Caucus, you know, they had the audacity to release a public letter to President Biden very gently, very gently and with a lot of flowery words calling for diplomacy and for him to lead a diplomatic effort to end the war between Russia and Ukraine. And within 24 hours, they retracted the letter and essentially were cowering in the corner. You know, we can imagine the kind of pressure that they were under to do that and the kind of public criticism that they received for daring to call for peace. So, so the voices for peace within the Democratic Party have been silenced. Rather than this big tent inclusive Democratic Party, we now have party leaders who are focusing their efforts on dividing us, on racializing every issue, using identity politics to, you know, gain a few political points and votes, undermining fundamental freedoms, freedom of speech, advocating censorship, not only advocating for it, but trying to create government entities in order to shut us up. 
uh, weaponizing the national security state to go after political opponents. The principles and ideals that the Democratic Party stands for today are directly counter to those that are fundamental and foundational to this country. And now we're at a point where President Biden has most dangerously dragged us essentially to to the brink of nuclear war. And that's where, Bobby, I'd love to ask you a question in this in this realm, in this vein of foreign policy, given the realities that we are facing, given, you know, we're increasingly hearing a lot of politicians, Republicans and Democrats, frankly, and including President Biden, who are actively and aggressively calling for a complete decoupling of the United States and China's economies. And the Biden administration is actively moving forward quickly in this direction. Elon, you recently talked about how the United States and China's interests are intertwined like conjoined twins. I think really making the point that this act of decoupling our economies would essentially be like ripping apart conjoined twins, implying the catastrophic consequences that would occur as a result for both both of these countries and the world. So Bobby, what would your approach be with the United States relationship with China? Do you believe that it's actually possible to have a peaceful coexistence or even a win relationship with China? Or do you believe that it is a zero sum game where in order for the United States to win that China must lose? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Tulsi. And my you know, my approach to that would be, let's recognize the reality that, that China is a very ambitious nation and that it does want to compete for us for influence in the world. But the reality is it does not want to compete with us militarily. It does not want to have a war with the United States. And China still has, you know, is still a very poor country compared to us. They have a, the Chinese have per capita, about one third the income of the United States. They want to have better lives for their citizens. And, you know, they want to compete with us in places all around the world. I think we ought to be competing. I think we ought to be competing with the with them on an economic platform, not a military one. And I feel very, I'm not scared of the Chinese. I'm not frightened that American ingenuity is going to fall behind the Chinese. I think it will be that kind of competition is a competition that will be good for the whole world. And it's a competition that is a collaborative piece, a collaborative world rather than a competitive world, a kind of collaborative competition, if you will. And, you know, the Chinese do not want to have a war with us. We have, we spend more on our military. We're now spending 1.3 trillion a year on military, including veterans benefits, which you can't cut back. But, you know, we were told after the Cold War ended that we were going to get a peace dividend and we were going to cut our military budget back to 200 billion a year. Instead, we've got it at 1.3 billion a year if you include you know, veterans benefits and national security. And and we never got that piece of it. So we now spend more on our military than the top 10 next nations in the world. We spend three times, we have three times the military budget of the Chinese. The Chinese can, we have five times the nuclear weapons of the Chinese. The Chinese cannot and do not want to compete with us militarily. The Chinese have about one and a half military bases in the world. We have 800. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that says, oh, the Chinese are, you know, want to be our enemy and have a military competition. They don't. What we should be doing is de-escalating the military pressure on China. We should be talking to China, for God's sake. We haven't had a meeting with China in five years. We know what our objectives are. We want to rebuild our industrial base in the United States. We don't want the Chinese to take that from us. And any negotiations with the Chinese should not be about military swaggering. It should be about how do we have an economic relationship with you that is going to benefit all parties the way that every good economic relationship does. And here's what our objective is in the next round of negotiations is we want to rebuild our industrial base here in the United States and any agreement that we make, any transaction that we make with the Chinese that should be foremost in our minds. How do we do that? But I'm not, you know, the Chinese have been doing a lot better than us because they've been projecting economic power abroad and that the world likes that. We think the world is on our side, but it isn't. All we've got, the only people who are supporting this, you know, this pugnacious bellicose relationship with China are Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Japan, 
Britain, Canada, and the United States, and we're pretty much alone in the world. The rest of the world is looking at us and saying, what the heck are you doing? Why are you trying to create a war with China? Why are you fighting them over, over why are you making Taiwan a military issue? Let's let that, Taiwan and China work out that issue on their own and back off militarily and try to have a, they want, they don't want war. They want peace and they want prosperity and that cannot happen where there's a war. So let's have, you know, let's de-escalate the war talk. Let's compete economically and let's talk to them and figure out a way that, you know, we can have a smart negotiation where we do better because of China rather than, you know, giving away the store and exporting jobs, which all the other treaties have done. Instead, let's figure out how to have an economic relation, a financial relationship with them that rebuilds the American industrial base. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, you know, this is such an, obviously, this issue and the broader issue of foreign policy is is central to any presidential race. And it's unfortunate that traditionally, as we've seen, these issues are very rarely given the kind of attention they deserve. And yet again, this is exactly why there should be presidential primary debates for the sake of the American people to have a clear choice, a clear informed choice on who they would like to see as our president and commander in chief. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insight. And uh, thank you, Elon and David, for hosting this important conversation. And see, you know, we haven't had we haven't had a serious economic some, a meeting, even a political meeting with the Chinese since 15, seven years. You know, the, the CIA director, Bill Burns, recently went over there to meet with the Chinese, but that's not the kind of meeting. We, we need to have a real political and economic discussion with them. And that is frank and that, you know, that let where everybody puts their cards on the table and to see if there's ways that we can work with each other peacefully and keep the world at peace. Why in the world would we go? And, and this is on, you know, this is on President, you know, President Biden has forbidden his State Department which are run by NIA, has forbidden any kind of talks or outreach to the Chinese. That is outrageous. You know, it is exactly the opposite of what Dwight Eisenhower was trying to do, where, you know, to find the road to peace with the Russians, which was disrupted by the, you know, the CIA's misbegotten U-2 flights. And then my uncle tried to do this thing. Let's have peace with the with Russia. Let's have peace with China. And let's all enjoy the prosperity of healthy economic competition. Well said. Well said, Bobby. Thank you. It's actually something that is worth uh, is that on my recent trip, trip to China, I with the senior leadership there, I we had I think some very productive discussions on uh, artificial intelligence risks and the need for some oversight or regulation. And my understanding from those conversations is that China will be initiating AI regulation in, in China. So that that was those were very promising discussions. And you know, I, I pointed out that if you know if there is a digital superintelligence that is overwhelmingly powerful developed in China, the it is actually a risk to the sovereignty of the Chinese government. And I think they took that concern to heart. Yeah, I mean, I love you you saying that because it makes us understand that no matter how you feel about China, if we are not able to negotiate with our adversaries on issues like that, there are now existential threats. And it's not just AI, it's these bioweapons development where, you know, we have these labs now all over the world in Ukraine, et cetera, that are developing all kinds of hideous, and including, you know, ethnic bioweapons that kill people from certain races, et cetera, that are designed to do that and they already have them. And, and they're ready to escape. And, you know, every country in the world has wanted to ban bioweapons. We, we initiated, Richard Nixon signed the Bioweapons Treaty in 19... Got all the countries in the world to agree to, to stop developing them. But we, the CIA, continue to secretly develop them. And then after 2000, when we passed the Patriot Act and we relaunched the bioweapons arms race, so now every country in the world, or many countries, are now developing them. We should shut the whole thing down. You know, COVID was clearly a bioweapons problem. We And you saw what that did to us. What if it was a real disease, a disease that had a 50% mortality, like gay fever or Ebola or, you know, one of these other really deadly viruses? They've got those in the labs, too. What if that was the one that is? Let's shut it down around the world. Let's have a real shutdown of all bioweapons development and verification of that. And then let's sit down with the other people from Iran, from, from Israel, from Russia and China and talk about, okay, and make sure 
that one country does not develop a weapon that is going to kill all the rest of us. We need to have, you can't just have one country regulating this. China alone cannot be regulating the development of digital super. You need the United States and China. All of us need to be participating. All of us need to be able to police the research. It's happening in other countries and we need to have transparency and protection. Otherwise, we are headed down the road to a very grim dystopian future for all of humanity. We're, we are beyond the point where we cannot, where we can afford the luxury of not negotiating about these things with the other powers in the planet. And, you know, we need a president who is aware of these threats to humanity and sees himself as the guardian of all of humanity and is thinking about this 24 hours a day. How do we avert this kind of future, a bioweapons extinction or a, a extinction? It, it's be, we cannot afford not to negotiate about this stuff anymore. And how allowed all these agencies, the CIA is developing this stuff too. And we have no idea they are not friendly to the American, you know, the American system. You know, I talked to Mike Pompeo the other day and he said that, he said what? He said when he was at the agency, he was very candid and you know, really smart about the agency. And he said when he was there, he did not do a good job of dismantling, of, you know, of dismantling agency capture at the CIA. And he said that, he said, if you take the upper echelon at that agency, it's made up almost entirely of people who do not believe in the institutions of the United States and democracy. And, you know, so and I think that's absolutely true from everything I know. And I know a lot about that agency. And we've got to, you know, we have got to get off a war footing, which gives these institutions the excuse to be super secret and non-transparent, pretend we're at a, you know, at a, in a, in, and put us in a security state where they can develop all these crazy technologies in secret that are going to kill us all. It's crazy. It is, Bobby. And that really gets to, to your central point about diplomacy and Elon, you know, your example of what can come about when we're just really willing to have a conversation. The president of the United States should be trusted by the American people to put the well-being and interests of the American people at the forefront of the decisions that, that he or she makes. There are common threats and concerns that exist with people around the world. We don't live in vacuums. And while we may have differences with other countries, things like AI, things like the threat of nuclear war, things like protecting our environment so that we as humans on this planet have clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and that we can grow food to survive. You mentioned the bioweapons. There are so many different challenges that, that we must address together. And we need a leader who recognizes that and puts those interests in the well-being of the people ahead of the whole cabal of special interests that, that you've talked about. All right. Thank you, Tulsi. But by the way, Bobby, I think probably the most surreal moment of the entire Ukraine war so far has been when Victoria Nuland was testifying before Congress and admitted that there was a secret network of biolabs in Ukraine who contained materials that were so potentially dangerous that she was worried about them falling into Russian hands. Yeah, after the media had been characterizing that, that fact as disinformation, as Russian disinformation for weeks and then and punishing those of us who were saying, yeah, this is what's happening. And then Victoria Newland gets in front of Congress and gets a, you know, a, a free question from Marco Rubio and actually is under oath and answers it honestly and says, yeah, we got bioweapons labs there and we're really scared the Russians are going to get, get in there and get our stuff. It was so weird because why in the world would we have bio labs there? It's just so, so strange. The, the media <laughs> continued to pile on, by the way, even after she testified and answered Marco Rubio's question. Honestly, I cited her quote in uh, some statements I made agreeing with you, Bob. Yep. Tulsi, we lose. Sorry, uh, especially in a time of war where they would be vulnerable to whatever pathogens might exist in those bio labs being released and causing threat to the world. Ukraine has blacklisted me from visiting their country ever again. And I was posts that I put on social media sites were banned or shadow banned because of this claim of misinformation and disinformation. News outlets across the country called, you know, criticized me of spreading misinformation, disinformation, even when I cited the DOD website that stated this as fact. I think it just shows even when they speak the truth, 
they're apparently uh, afraid of the truth and want to be able to continue what they're doing, no matter the risk. So Does Ukraine a have a free press out of curiosity? No way. No. They, oh, okay. Just wanted to confirm that. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Well, there, were, there was an article just today in Semaphore, of all places, talking about how media has to be licensed by the government there. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. And then separately, talk about embarrassing revelations. The New York Times today has a story about how pesky Nazi insignias keep turning up on the uniforms of you know Ukrainian army members, and then they have to keep censoring photos so that these things don't appear in the press. Of course, the New York Times says that the biggest problem with this is not that advanced Western weapons may be finding their hands into you know the hands of neo Nazis, but rather that this will play into Russian propaganda. But regardless of what it is, again, it's one of these embarrassing data points that show that. You know, we're constantly being fed information about this war and then these things, you know, pop up and you realize that, you know, they may not be telling us everything. I mean, we've been propagandized with these comic book depictions that are now formulaic, you know, that there's a bad guy. He did a bad thing. It was unprovoked. And the United States needs to go in and fix this situation by the people he's victimizing. And, you know, it's such a good testimony to the American people that, you know, that they that they're willing to make those sacrifices I mean, in some cases of our children, of our fortune to go in and help other countries. But the problem is we're being victimized too by our own agencies, which are, you know, which are leaving out the contextual information, which are leaving out the nuance, which are leaving out the entire history in this case of U.S. propagands, which brought us into, which brought us and also brought Ukraine into a war that is not helping Ukraine. Ukraine. Ukraine has now lost probably 350,000 kids, and they are in much worse position than when they began, when they, you know, in, in February 14, 2014. They, we, in 2019, they could have signed the Minsk Accords and kept Donbass and had no, nobody killed. And they're never going to, and they're never going to get back to that place again. And as you guys understand, the Russians are not going to win this war. They cannot afford to win this war. This war is existential for Russia. And it'd be, it would be like us losing a war you mean, to Mexico. You mean Ukraine? You mean Ukraine can't? I'm sorry, Ukraine. I'm Ukraine. sorry, Ukraine cannot win this war. And, you know, they're now, it's unclear what the ratio, the death ratio is, but there's credible information that they are suffering deaths that are seven deaths for every one Russian killed. And we are we have turned this country into this, you know, to a slaughterhouse of the flower of Ukrainian youth to benefit the geopolitical ambitions of these, you know, of the U.S. Nikons who want to exhaust the Russian army and exercise regime change over Vladimir Putin. And, and we and the, the Ukraine is a victim in this war. It's a proxy war. It's a victim of Russia. Yes. It's, it was an illegal invasion and a brutal invasion that could have been avoided by Vladimir Putin. But they're equally, almost equally at least, a victim of U.S. policies and, you know, the ambitions and aspirations of the Nikons who wanted to get into this war no matter what. I think the war was easily avoidable if we had been willing to use diplomacy and basically give a written guarantee to the Russians that Ukraine would not become part of NATO. That is what they were demanding in December of 2021 in a written ultimatum to to the White House. It's what they were explicitly with our Secretary of State in January of 2022. And those negotiations ended where we said we wouldn't close NATO's door. And then, like you said, the other thing we didn't do was give support to the Minsk agreements, which would have provided some limited autonomy to the ethnic Russians in the Donbass, and that would have solved that sort of civil war that was going on there. If we had just done those two things, I think there's a really good chance that this war never would have occurred. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you can't know that. But the point is, we tried. We never tried taking NATO off the table. We never tried giving our support to the Minsk agreements. Yeah, and there's a big question because Zelensky ran in 2019 on a peace platform. And I've pointed out before that, you know, he was a, he's a comedian and an actor, which I'm not saying in a disparaging way because my wife is also both of those things. But he, I say that because he had no involvement in politics. And yet he won in this huge landslide with 70% of the vote because he was running on a peace platform with the promise that he would sign the Minsk Accords and settle this. And the Minsk Accords did the same thing that Ultimatum did, which is they said, 
NATO will forever keep out of Ukraine, and that and that we that they would that that Donbass would be made an autonomous region within the Ukraine that was still governed by the Ukraine, but would be able to retain its own language and culture and be able to protect its citizens against a violent aggression and deadly aggression from forces like the Azov Battalion and, you know, and, and other hostile forces within the Ukrainian government. And they, and by the way, the Ukraine, they voted 90 to 10 to leave the Ukraine and join Russia, join the Russian Federation, 90 to 10. And the Russian Vladimir Putin said, no, we don't want you. We want Ukraine to stay a complete country. And I, and that was, and then, you know, they agreed, Russia agreed, France agreed, Germany agreed on the Minsk Accords, which was a reasonable settlement. Keep you, keep NATO out of the Ukraine. And why, you know, my uncle, President Kennedy used to always say, if you want to have, the only way to have peace is if you put your, yourself into the shoes of your adversary. And he gave this very famous speech on July or June 10th, five days now, it'll be the 60th anniversary of American University, his most important speech, which was, which turned the country around on the atmospheric test ban treaty. It was the first test ban treaty. It was the first treaty of the nuclear age. It was the first treaty to ban certain use of nuclear weapons. He and Russia, he and Khrushchev agreed on it privately without involving the State Department. The State Department opposed it, the military opposed it, Congress and the Senate opposed it, but the American people ended up supporting it after he gave this speech and then did a national tour. But in that speech was a fascinating speech because he was explaining for the first time to the American people the role and the suffering that Russia had endured during World War II. As I grew up in a generation where we were told that America had won the war against the Nazis. And, you know, we were watching shows like Combat with Vic Morrow every week on TV and that showed how Americans had been the victor and, you know, and without America, the, the world would have been lost. My uncle was telling the American people, that's not true. The people who beat Hitler were the Russians and they made a sacrifice that is unimaginable to anybody else in the world. Hitler invaded Russia through the Ukraine and then killed one out of every seven Russians and leveled the nation, one third of the nation. My uncle went during that speech, he said, imagine if all of the American continent, the continental United States was reduced to rubble between the East Coast and Chicago. That's what happened to Russia. You've got to understand that if we're going to have peace with this country. And, you know, we need to understand that today. We need to put ourselves in the shoes. By the way, it's not just Putin. The R Russian leadership back in the 90s said, you know, in 92, they, we made it, they made an agreement. They said, we will pull our troops, our 400,000 troops out of East Germany, and we will turn East Germany over to a hostile army, the NATO army. And the concession that we want from you for that is that you will not move NATO to the east. And President Bush famously told them, we will not move NATO one inch to the east. Then the leader of the Nikons, Joe Brzezinski, the grandfather of all the Nikons in 1997, laid out a plan for, taking, for moving NATO into every one of the former Russian satellite states. And, and at that time, George Cannon, who was the, the most important diplomat in American history, he was the architect of the Cold War containment policy. He was a deity in terms of American statesmanship and diplomacy. He said that if you move NATO to the east as your pleasant event planning, it will be a calamity that will end in the, forcing the Russians to, to violence because you are intruding on their national security. Bill Perry, who at that time was the Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton, threatened to resign because he said this is a formula for war with Russia. And put, this is long before Putin came in. Bill Burns, who was the Russia, the U.S. ambassador in Moscow at that time, said the same thing. He said this is a formula that is going to force the Russians into war. Bill Burns, incidentally, is now the head of the CIA. So these were the most important diplomats who were saying, if you move NATO to the east, you're going to force the Russians into war. And we moved it to every country except one, Ukraine. And then we said, and that was the one where Russia said it is a red line. Bill Burns, in fact, wrote a note, a memo from Moscow to the State Department saying, yet means yet. And he said, if you move it into the Ukraine, they are going to go to war. 
They're not. It is a red yeah. line that you cannot cross. And yet we just neocons got, you know, they did as much as they could up through the Bush administration. Then they were in exile. And they came back in Trump and they and what else did they do in Trump? They got rid of two nuclear treaties. So we walked away from two treaties, the intermediate nuclear weapons treaties that banned intermediate nuclear weapons stationed anywhere near Russia. And we unilaterally walked away from that. And then we installed Aegis missile systems in Romania and Poland that were nuclear capable, that can fire Tomahawk missiles and get to Russia in a few minutes and decapitate the entire leadership. The Russians said, OK, you got that. We're putting up with it, but we're not going to put up with that in Ukraine because Ukraine is 400 miles from Russia. You'll be able to decap our leadership, decapitate our leadership in seconds. And that will that is likely to destabilize the entire region and lead to a preemptive strike. And yet we did it anyway. And it, it's just it's dumbfounding what we did. You know, the blunder. This is like sleepwalking into World War One. This is exactly what happened. You know, in World War One, where you had these great powers acting like idiots and sleepwalking into this, you know, war that accomplished nothing. And now we're right on that. Now we have nuclear weapons and we're going up. We're picking a fight with a country that has a thousand more nuclear weapons than we do. It's just insane. Elon, did you want to comment up there? I just saw you. You went off mute. Sorry. Just, I mean, I, I share a lot of these concerns. I, I mean, I think certainly if, if, if there's not some, some kind of peace or ceasefire that is uh, figured out soon, I, I agree that we're essentially sending the flower of the Ukrainian youth and Russian youth. I think very few of those people actually want to be there to die in the trenches. And I think it's uh, morally rep reprehensible if, if, you know, if diplomats are having, you know, fine dinners while all these kids are dying in the trenches. It's just crazy. Yeah. I, 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 let me ask uh, on, on the energy subject, what, what are your views on nuclear power? Well, I'm hesitant to get in a fight with Michael Schellenberg here because he and I have been disputing this for years. But what I've always said, Elon, is that nuclear power, I'm all for nuclear power. If you can make it safe and you can make it economical. And right now, it's just so far from being either. And it's not me saying it's unsafe. It's the insurance industry. The insurance industry regards this nuclear power as so unsafe that they will not give them an insurance policy. And, you know, we've seen their record. The record is horrific. You know, what's happened where they're, you know, now they're, there's probably a square mile of these tanks that they're, they put water in every day because it's contaminated water. They're trying to keep it out of the Pacific, but there's no way to ever stop it. So they're building these huge tanks and there's, and you can look on the internet, they go all the way to the horizon. You know, we've watched what happened in Chernobyl, et cetera. But putting aside the past performance of this industry, which has been cataclysmic, you just, you know, if the, if they, if the suddenly they get a technology that makes them safe and get an insurance policy so that we don't have to worry about it right now, you know, they've gone to Congress, they can't get insurance. So they've gone to Congress and in a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night, Passed the Price Anderson Act, which gives them, which absolves them from liability. It gives them immunity from liability. So they're just like the vaccine industry. There's no incentive for them to behave because they don't have to pay the cost. The, the homeowners pay the cost. My insurance policy in my home in Mount Kisco had a provision in it that that this does not insure you against radiation from a nuclear accident at Indian Point. It was my own. So they shifted the burden to me. And the industry shouldn't be allowed to do that. And then secondly, it's so catastrophically expensive. To build a solar plant costs a billion dollars a gig. A wind plant costs 1.1, 1.2. A, a coal plant costs about 3.6 billion a gigawatt. And the last nuclear power plant built costs 15 billion a gigawatt. So, and then you have to pay for the, you know, the mining of the uranium. You have to pay for the technicians. You have to pay for the outages. You have to pay for the storage of the waste for the next 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. And there's no utility in the world will build a nuclear power plant unless it's fully subsidized by the public. So, it, you know, I believe in free market capitalism. You, we could make energy by burning prime rib if we wanted to. But, you know, why don't we take the cheapest way to make energy, which is, you know, 
which is going to be some alternative that is not nuclear. If you can make nuclear competitive, I'm for it. But I am a free market absolutist, and I believe that we should take the cheapest form of energy, that you, we should have no subsidies, no ec- and all the companies should have to internalize their costs the same way that they internalize their profits, and that means the cost of pollution. Now, you, you can't have a company that can put acid rain, a coal company acidifying every lake in the Appalachians and, and you know, from Georgia to northern Quebec putting mercury in all of our every freshwater fish in America, acidifying the ocean, chopping down all the mountains. They need to pay those costs to the American public. The loss of those resources have to be paid for. And if they did that, nobody would buy coal because it's it's supposed to be cheap, but it's the most cataclysmic, expensive form of energy that's probably ever been denied, except for nuke which is the most expensive way to boil a pot of water that anybody has ever imagined. So I just, I believe in markets, free market capitalism, and that ought to apply to the energy industry. And at this point, Nuke just can't compete. All right, guys, we, we have a, just a quick time check here. I think we only got Bobby for another few minutes. We've been going for about two hours. So I want to make sure we get in some questions from the crowd. Actually, D- David, I just want to just quickly respond to that, if I may, and, sure. and then but for sure. So... I, I certainly agree uh, that you know that solar power and wind are great. I'm a huge supporter of solar and wind. And I also agree that the the costs of coal power plants are underestimated. They're actually, if you add, uh, add up the deaths from coal mining and uh, the sort of the effects on uh, people's lungs who live near the coal plants, it, it's pretty bad. It's actually way worse than nuclear. So, but I, I do want to sort of voice my opinion that, in my opinion, actually nuclear is very safe. If you look at the actual, you know, deaths from nuclear power, it, it is they're minuscule compared to so, certainly any fossil fuel power generation. That they're, the fear of nuclear is very high. And I think the the concern, you know, it's not clear to me why the insurance companies charge so much, but but it, you know, I, I think that the modern nuclear plants are extremely uh, safe, and I would actually. Although this does go against a lot of people's views, I actually am a believer in a nuclear vision. So I just want to state that for the record, and we can move on to something else. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Only a few more minutes, so there's so much more stuff to get to. Bobby, you mentioned that your wife is an actor and comedian like Mr. Zelensky, and actually we were able to, I, I noticed you're all in the room, so we, we brought her on stage. You're all <laughs> welcome, and I, I get you a question, which is, well, how, how do you feel about Bobby running for president? And I'm also curious about what all of your friends in Hollywood think about his candidacy. Can you guys hear me okay? I didn't, I didn't know you were going to do this. Yes. Oh, no, I didn't either. I was just sitting here minding my own wax, listening and enjoying the conversation. And, oh, oh, what? I know I forgot the question. How do I feel about it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how do your Hollywood friends feel about it? Put you on the spot. Well, by the way, I love that they're called my Hollywood friends. <laughs> They would be like, I'm sure there's not one friend of mine that considers themselves a Hollywood friend. But, well, first of all, yes, it took a little while to get used to the idea of Bobby running. And, you know, I took some time with it. Bobby and I talked about it a lot and and decided, yes, this is what needs to happen. And honestly, it's been really interesting and at times exciting. It's really fun for me to witness Bobby in his element. You know, I really feel confident that this is what he is meant to do. So he, he is just, I just see him in this light that's shining on him at this moment. And it's really exciting to watch. So I know at the same time, I know there will be challenges that I, you know, hope I'm I know I'll be strong enough to face, but I, so I know there'll be challenges that we'll have to face and, you know, we'll have, we'll get through them. Yeah. And Cheryl, um, I told, Cheryl told me when she finally, you know, decided, okay, we'll go along with this. She said, she, Cheryl, before she was an actor and even while she was an early actor, she made her living bartending. And she said that she was going to go to the Bahamas and invent a new kind of margarita that had in it. And that was going to be her solution. I'm a very practical person. All right. Well, th- thanks for uh, thanks for being a good sport, Cheryl. I, I saw you in the crowd. I couldn't resist pulling you up here. So appreciate well, that. It's nice to it's nice to be acknowledged. And and thank you, thank you guys, Elon and David, for hosting and doing this. And I'll slip back into the background now.
All right, sounds good. All right, let me pull in. We'll hear from Kelly Slater, and there's a couple of questions from the crowd I want to take as well. But Balj, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mr. Kendi, I've been impressed with your sophistication on a number of issues related to peace, civil liberties, CBDCs, Bitcoin. I really only have one question. It relates to our financial system. The short version of it is, will you be able to dig into the devaluation of treasuries and other government bonds by the Fed? As a little bit of background, the Fed has turned treasuries into new toxic waste. A series of ill-considered moves has turned the so-called safest asset in the world into the riskiest asset in the world and set the stage for a second financial crisis. Stanford estimates the bond losses to be in the trillions. Dalio says they extend far beyond banks to pension funds, insurance companies, and other institutions. Nuriel, Nuriel Rabini says most banks are technically near insolvency and hundreds are already fully insolvent. The Guardian says banks' unrealized loss on bond portfolios are sufficiently large as to represent systemic risk. And Euromoney says U.S. Treasury bonds no longer meet the standards for high-quality liquid assets. Right now, this bond crisis is being downplayed or blamed on everyone other than the Fed and Treasury. But fundamentally, Treasury sold assets in 2021 that Fed then devalued in 2022, undercutting the balance sheets of countless banks and other financial institutions. In short, Fed lied, banks died. Treasuries are the new toxic waste. The Western financial system is a whole blown its bedrock asset and a second global financial crisis is brewing. There are no obvious paths out of this that don't involve printing a lot of money. So while I recognize it's a somewhat arcane sounding topic, just like subprime and CDOs unfortunately once were, will we be able to dig into the devaluation of treasuries and other government bonds by the Fed? And that's your question. I wish you hadn't prefaced it by saying yes. I had so much sophistication on every other issue because my only <laughs> answer here is that yes. would, will you please be my treasury secretary? Because I'd like you, if you got a solution, I want to hear it. I, I don't have lots of solutions. Uh -huh. I can tell you what I think the problem is, but we can talk about it afterwards if you want. I would and, love, uh, I would I love that. I can show you all the graphs. I would love that. And I, okay, you know, I, I do... You know, I have a deep and long time concern about the, that it has been deeply ingrained in my family for generations about just the out of control nature of the Fed and, you know, what, and the impact of the Fed, not only on the global money supply, but on democracy and on personal freedoms, et cetera. And my uncle tried to do something about that by at least decoupling the money supply to base currency, to gold and silver. And he, you know, initiated during his term gold certificates and silver certificates were, which would at least have some part of the money supply that was, that could not be easily manipulated because it was attached to the base currency. But after his death, we went back to a full fiat currency. And that's, you know, I think that the root of all of the issues, ultimate issues that you're talking about right now. And I, you know, I do not have a high enough level of education to be able to sit here and tell you that I have a simple answer to it. I've talked to a lot of people and I've gotten a lot of different answers about how do you address it, but nobody claims that there is a panacea. But, you know, we're about to hit a wall and, you know, we're already watching people lose faith in our, in our credit, in our currency. And, you know, and the U.S. dollar is now being threatened with losing its status as the world's reserve currency. Brazil has already signaled that it's moving away to the China, you know, adopting Chinese currency, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Pakistan, many other countries are. And that will be that will be a cat of the United States that will make the Great Depression look like a cakewalk. And and so I know, I understand the emergency nature of trying to figure out a way that can, you know, to deal with this crisis. And I would love to talk to you about it if you have ideas and anybody who thinks that they can help solve this problem. All right. Sounds okay. good. I, we could spend the whole show just talking about these issues. We only have a few minutes left, so I want to I want to move on. Thanks, Balaji, and uh, happy to connect you guys afterwards so you can talk some more about it. Uh, Bobby, a question from the crowd. We, we got a lot of questions on the issue of gun control. I think it's one of the biggest topics in the feed. Here's one of them from a user, Pat King. He says, I need to know your detailed stance and policy on the Second Amendment before you get my vote. That's likely the only thing holding me back from voting for you. What do you say to him and the other people on the issue of gun control? Uh, my position on the gun control is I'm not going to take away anybody's guns. I no, I'm I'm a constitutional absolutist, and he, you know, we can argue about when the Second Amendment was intended to protect guns, but that argument is now been settled by the Supreme Court, and and it has a very and the Supreme Court, you know, the Antonine Scalia's decision is a very expansive interpretation of the right to own a gun. But more importantly, I don't you know, anybody who tells you that by 
with incremental changes or incremental laws in regulating. Uh, and by the way, I want to say this. I have two members of my family that were killed in gun violence. So, you know, I take, I understand the heartbreak that this is causing to so many Americans. It's touched my family directly. And I know as president that you are going to expect me and I'm going to do everything I can to reduce gun violence in this country. I think one of the tools that has been taken out of my hands is taking away people's guns. I don't think it's the right thing right now because it will just polarize our country. I've lived in rural areas of this country. I know how integrated gun culture is in those areas and how important it is to them from a in the way they view the Constitution. I also know we're living in a time when the Constitution has been under attack, all the other amendments in an unprecedented way. And how that would be seen by people who believe strongly in the in the Second Amendment as part of a systematic assault on our Bill of Rights. And I don't want to get into that debate. I want to stop the school shootings. And if it comes down to protecting the schools the way that we protect airlines, I will do that. I do not want any more children dying in our schools. I also am going to look very closely at the role of psychiatric drugs in these events. And there are no good studies right now that that should have been done years ago on this issue because there's a tremendous a circumstantial evidence that those like SSRIs and benzos and other drugs are doing this. There's something happening in our country right now that is not happening anywhere else in the world and has never happened in human history. And you have to look at some of the, almost all of these drugs. If you look at their manufacturer's inserts, they include a side effect of homicidal and suicidal behavior. And prior to the introduction of Prozac, we had almost no, none of these events in our country, and we've never seen them in his, human history, where people walk into a schoolroom of children or strangers and start shooting people. There's other nations that have as many guns per capita as we do. Switzerland, the last school shooting was 21 years ago. We have one every 21 hours. The one thing that we have that's different than anybody in the world is the amount of psychiatric drugs our children are taking and our people are taking. And we need to look at that. And NIH should have done that years ago, but they will not do it. And they'll block other people from doing it because they are because they're working not for us, but for the pharmaceutical industry. And this is their major profit center. Today. And so nobody wants to hear none of those, you know, the pharma does not want to hear about any problems with SSRIs. But I will do those studies immediately when I get into office. And we're going to get the truth. Something is something, you know, guns, the proliferation of guns, clearly a bet violence. But anybody who tells you that they can remove enough guns, AR-15s or whatever, by tinkering at the margins and get to the kind of the situation that they have in Western Europe is pulling your leg. It's not going to happen. We need to look now at other solutions. And, we, and the only way we're ultimately going to get Gun controls in this country is through consensus, and that consensus cannot happen when we're all at each other's throats. We need to assure the public, people who feel insecure about the Constitution, that our Constitution is no longer under threat, that nobody wants to come and take away their guns, and that will bring people to the table and say, okay, how do we protect our children? And that's what I'm going to try to do as president. All right, thank you. Let's go to Kelly Slater. Kelly, it looks like you're on a skateboard somewhere. You have a question for Bobby? Yeah, can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yeah. All right. Great to talk to you, Bobby. How are you, sir? Very well, um, Kelly. Thank you for calling. All right. I appreciate it. I think I speak for everyone when I say it's so refreshing to hear you talk about all these topics, things like reaching across the aisle. I, it was really nice to see Tulsi on here. She's a good friend. I know what she's been through when she went to Syria and spoke to the leader over there. She got completely attacked for it at home. But to your point earlier regarding China, regarding Russia, other places, I mean, we need to have dialogue with these people. And I don't know why that's seen as such a bad thing. It doesn't mean you're in agreement. It means you're just trying to solve solutions, come up with solutions. But we see that at home more and more with the media. And as you have pointed out earlier, I think things get into what seems like dangerous ground when you start to talk about the implications of big pharma and other companies being in cahoots with media, then controlling the narrative, trying to cancel people like yourself. There's some frightening topics. So I find it really refreshing to listen to you, listen to the transparency that you have when speaking about all these different topics. And, and I guess that leads me back to 
sort of my question, because I see you as almost a Trojan horse for transparency and honesty. And it's really refreshing in this political environment. And I feel like at times so far, you've been, they've attempted to reduce you to small talking points in the media. And, and I love to hear you talking about all these other things other than them focusing on your vaccine stance, questioning medical things. But as you get into all these other topics, we learn so much. So I just wonder how you'll change that narrative for people to hear your broader message and to continue to get that out. Because there's so many challenging things, but also the way you talk about them is really inspiring. Thank you so much, Kelly. And, and thank you for your courage during, you know, during the pandemic. You were really one of the few people at a time when athletes were being bullied all over the world. You were one of the few people who were standing up and, you know, you came and talked to me on my podcast when literally nobody in the world would talk to me. So I, I won't ever forget that. And I'm, you know, I'm such an admirer of yours, not only as an athlete, who's one of my favorite athletes, but also as for your moral courage and for your really gentle, sweet approach to the world, you know, and loving approach to the world, which is so inspiring. I, you know what, I don't have a good strategy other than I don't lead ever with vaccine stuff. I've got, you know, I've been sort of silenced on all of these issues for 18 years. And I feel like I got, a, you know, a lot of, a lot of bursting with things that, opinions that people may not want to hear. You know, I don't ever need to talk about vaccines again. But if somebody asks me about vaccines, I'm going to tell them the truth. And a lot of times people ask me about them and then they immediately want to shut me up because it's like turning on a fire hose. And I, you know, I have a lot of domain knowledge. I know a lot about the issue. And, and so I would, you know, what I would say also generally to the press, if you don't want to hear about vaccines from me, don't ask me about them and you know, you'll never have to listen to me. But if you ask me, you shouldn't be shutting me up when I answer your question. Uh, but, you know, I think I've, I've actually been doing pretty well, Kelly, and being able to talk about some of these issues, you know, about the Ukraine, about the censorship, about the economy, about the destruction of the American middle class, about the, the appropriation of our foreign policy by neocons, about the appropriation of our domestic policy by Wall Street and, you know, the big corporate dictators and the capture of our agencies by the industries they're supposed to regulate. And, you know, I have now, it's been, you know, Cheryl and I have been astonished by how much traction these issues are getting. It's really been, you know, she said that it was exciting and that I think both of us are, you know, excited that people seem to be listening and really care about these issues. So hopefully that will continue. And thanks for joining us, Kelly. Yeah, I appreciate it. And one last thing I wanted to say is just to mention, I've seen a couple interviews where people have really wanted to challenge you, but not listen to what you say. And I find that really enchanting to hear that kind of media. But you're always kind back and you give a thoughtful answer. And uh, I, I appreciate that because I think we all need more of that. It's a great way to, to approach any conversation with people, that, especially the ones you disagree with. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Kelly. Great. Here's a question from the crowd. Let's see here. Tanner E22 asks, is your energy policy going to continue destroying our landscapes with the seas of solar panels and windmills? And TX Frenchman asks, your stance on oil and gas, drill or no drill? Well, I don't have an easy answer for either of those things. I, you know, I think, like I said, I think we should not have that every energy system, every energy generator should have to internalize its cost. And so, and there's some cases like, for example, I've fought for many years offshore wind in the United States. I think offshore wind makes sense in, in some, in the North Atlantic and some parts of Europe, but in the United States, we have great onshore wind and we have the best onshore wind probably anywhere in the world of any continent except for Antarctica. And, and we have great economic opportunities and great places to do it where it does minimal environmental damage. A lot of the cornfields of North Dakota, for example, which are a huge economic boom for family farmers in North Dakota. And potentially if we have a grid system that can pick up that energy, could provide a lot of our energy. You know, I think Montana, North Dakota, and Texas have enough wind to provide 100% of our energy grid right now. People are, you know, building with highly subsidized wind power, wind turbines in the Atlantic, and and we're seeing these big whale kills that appear to be related to it. And to me, that's intolerable, and it's not something that we should be doing. So I'm against it. But, you know, everywhere, energy, 
there's no single solution for energy. Every one of them is, is connected to a locality and you have to measure the impacts on that locality of, you know, how much environmental damage per kilowatt hour. And that has, that, those costs need to be internalized so that the public can then make a rational choice that is market-based about what energy they want. And, and so that's how I, you know, that's how I would feel about that. All right. Thank you. I'm being informed by uh, Bobby's team that we have to go. We've been going for over two hours now and the time has flown by. So appreciate everyone who's participated, uh, everyone who is still waiting to ask a question. It, we just couldn't get to everybody, but there are going to be other opportunities. I'm confident in the future to keep doing this. Bobby's been super available on podcasts and interviews, so I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more from him. And if you want to follow his campaign, his team is telling me that you can go to his website, which is kick24.com. And if you want to contribute, you can do it there. or You can join a mailing list. So Kennedy24 is the website. Thanks so much for participating, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Elon. Thanks, guys. Yeah.